So, welcome to the Romp into the Past with Southern Arizona Senior Pride. This is our monthly meetings, as you, some of you know, who are regulars that come to this, and a special welcome to anyone who is uh, new to our session. For those of you who are new, this is going to be a really special time for us. Uh, you, you, I'm sure you are attracted because of the three speakers that we have for today. I'm going to be the moderator. Uh, it's going to be a wild romp, let me tell you. I've gotten together with the three of these, and it, it's, we're going to have some time. Let's just say that. It's going to be a real treat. These are all three icons of the LGBTQI plus community. Uh, Natalie Perry, Colette Barajas, and Randy Spaulding. I'm going to do a short introduction for each of them. Then they will each do about five minutes of their own on what they want to say. And then we'll just open it to, not open it, but the three of them will engage in sort of a wide ranging conversation. Now, in that wide ranging conversation, because we have prepped this, they have specifically asked me to let them know when it's going a little off long, when it's going off to a side topic or something like that. So when I gently let them know this, do not think I am being rude. We're going to finish at 3.30. And the only other little housekeeping part is because everyone is going to be muted except our panelists here. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat area, the chat box. Keith is going to be monitoring it. And then at the end, we're going to do the Q&A, and he'll be prepared for that. So the first one, uh, Colette. Colette, wave your hand in case there is just anyone who doesn't know you. Anyone who's lived in the, who lived in the 80s. Uh, I don't, uh, are we all muted, Joyce? I can, I'm hearing feedback. Anyway, uh, Colette, anyone who lived in the Tucson. No, you're muted. You're muted, Bruce. Thank you. I knew. You're muted, oh, you're again. muted again. I don't know. Bruce. Now I'm unmuted again. Am I working? Excellent. Colette Barajas. Here we go again. Colette is well known to anyone who was here in the 80s. She ran a, a famous or infamous bar, <laughs> and it had this tagline, which was a delicious tagline, a women's bar where all were welcome. And she now runs a successful business uh, at Centra Realty. Now, gay bars have been a part of her life uh, for the longest time. When she was young, her mother and another straight friend ran a gay bar in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, needless to say, they were known as significant gay advocates. And her father, Sam, actually worked the, bar at, uh, worked the door at her bar and the maintenance and was perhaps lovingly known, and I've heard lovingly known as Pops. And she became heavily involved in fundraisers for AIDS projects and remembers this as one of her things, which I'm sure she'll cover. Many in the lesbian community came together to help and care for gay men during that time. Then we have Randy Spaulding. Randy, if you want to just give a wave so they don't they know. Randy has a distinction of having lived half of his life in the area downtown in Armory Park in a 133-year-old house. Now, I did that intentionally, Randy, so they could try to mix up the mathematics of half your life in a 133-year-old house. But he retired in 2011 from a 40-year career as a special education teacher. And throughout the years, Randy has been a volunteer with EON, Wingspan's Youth Program, the Southern Arizona AIDS Foundation, and its precursor, the Tucson AIDS projects, Project. Now, here's one little bit that I think was the best part of his bio. He's been a speaker in many, before many groups, and he was frequently listed as a professional homosexual on numerous panels before civic groups, university students, and faculty. 
And now we have Natalie. Natalie, if you want to identify yourself with that. Natalie was the Grand Marshal of the 2019 Pride Parade and most deservedly so. Uh, when I talked to her, she says she's proud that she has always been out and never directly experienced any discrimination. She was a founding member of the Tucson Lesbian and Gay Pride Committee, has stuck with it through these years, and through that, she was a key driver of Tucson's anti-discrimination ordinance. She's proud to have been a part of the early on group of people who built a strong and resilient LGBTQI plus community and the foundation for the grassroots fight against HIV. Many of which of you I think are here to remember and join them and to cheer all of these three on. So with that, Colette, would you like to just give us about five minutes about your perspective of life back during those decades? <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, again, for those who don't know me, I'm Colette. Yeah, I just, uh, I mean, just listening to what you said, Bruce, makes me want to cry to, you know, I feel gifted to have come to this community back in the late 70s and have an opportunity to work with so many loving, caring people. Um, I, you know, back in the, the 80s, we couldn't get in the men's bar. So I said, you know, mm -hmm. I won't say what I said, but blank, blank, I'm gonna open my own place. And Conchita over on, on, on Grant was very happy because I took all the drunks out of there and brought them over to my place. <laughs> she was trying to run a nice little, um beer and wine coffee place and there we were the rowdy ones and uh so i opened in 1983 on uh, december 19th and really to create an atmosphere of safety uh well-being and uh, a place where, where people could come and gather and uh find <clears throat> find the <clears throat> strength with one another i mean that's really was my goal and I've been able to move it into my real estate career also. So it's just, I've just had a passion for women um, in, in helping them see their potential and uh, care for one another. So I just feel very fortunate that, you know, I met Natalie and <clears throat> Randy and um, was able to work on so many um, projects and bring so many, <clears throat> brought Margaret Gomez here and so many um, big stars to raise money for AIDS, uh, and we really, I mean, just, I can't even think of all the thing, the bears, I mean, all the money we raise, and, you know, but more so is, you know, caring, caring for our brothers back then, and that was, I mean, wow, you know, what, what an opportunity to be with somebody um, who was, you know, afraid, and we didn't, none of us knew what was going on, and and just, you know, be compassionate and care for them in their last days. So I feel that I'm the fortunate one by finding uh, Tucson and, and all of you who have supported me in all the ventures that we've done together. You know, it's it's a community does this, not, not three people. This is community. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Colette. Uh, and we're, uh, we're going to mute this, I think. And so now let's go to uh, Randy. Let's hear Randy's story. Well, I, I was born in Yuma, Arizona hmm. in 1950 and ended up moving to Tucson in 1970 to finish college. I was not out to me. It was a definite struggle um, um, and it took me until I was 26 years old, going through therapy and all kinds of things uh, before I was able to acknowledge to myself. So I came out to me in, in that year. And so the first time I'd gone to a gay bar was in 1976. Sadly, that was the first, or that year, that same year, 1976, was when a young man had gone to the same bar as I had gone to. His name was Richard Heakin. And some boys from Marana, high school boys from Marana, ended up murdering him outside, uh, beating him with pipes, uh, lead pipes. And um, for me, that was such a seminal 
amazing, scary, horrible moment, um, thinking how, you know, gay people are really in danger. And, and that was a very scary thing for me. Additionally, when the trial happened, uh, the boys were sentenced to finish high school. One thing I wanted to say, and I forgot, to, I was going to say this at the beginning, is I'm, I'm very humbled to be participating in this, in this group of three. Um, I definitely consider Colette and Natalie to be leaders uh, in the gay community. And, and for myself, I think I'm, I'm a behind the scenes kind of guy. So I think that there are so many people who, um, you know, are worthy of, of uh, representing the gay community as leaders. And I'm just real humbled um, um, because I don't feel that that was my role. Um, um, as, as I came out to myself more and more and, 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 and then came out to others, um, I developed a community and it ended up, many of them were downtown and that's why I'm still here now. Um, um, and so many of my friends lived in the same neighborhood. Um, and during that time, I started working, uh, a good friend who many of you know, Wayne Blankenship, um, was a facilitator for the youth group at the Women's Commission. And so at, at, uh, uh, he asked me if I would help out because he and Amy DeGroff were the only two adults working every weekend um, uh, as facilitators. So um, I joined with, with another person and, and that really changed my life in a lot of wonderful ways. Um, Jamie's here today. I met Jamie when he was 17 in that youth group and he was uh, uh, very helpful. He joined me on many occasions speaking to groups uh, fundraising and, and doing a lot of wonderful things. But I did that for a while and then that morphed into Wingspan thanks to many, many, many other people. Um, and, and youth group continued in that way. But that, that was very important to me. One thing I wanted to say as a teacher, I was a public school teacher and when I began my first job in 1972, um, I could have been fired for being gay. Uh, there was an incredible amount of discrimination in every way. So. Boy, just, I was thinking, I've been thinking leading up to today, how much how life has changed for all of us, you know, older folks here, um, what we've seen in, in our lifetimes, the differences between then and now. We aren't there yet, but, but we're definitely on our way. Thanks, Randy. And Natalie, you have stories to tell. Why don't you talk to us here and tell us? Natalie, on mute or whatever. Natalie, you're on. I'm on. Hi, I'm Natalie Perry. There you go. <laughs> um, I came to Tucson. I lived in Pennsylvania and was educated in Pennsylvania and taught school in Pennsylvania for seven years. And Bruce had said that I, you know, I never experienced any discrimination. My partner and I at the time we were both teaching in the same school district, lived together, and all of the teachers accepted us as a couple. Um, so when I came to Tucson and I, and I, a friend said, Natalie, you really should uh, join the uh, Tucson Gay Coalition because they're doing a lot of things that you might be interested in. So I, I, 1978, I went to the first meeting of the Tucson Gay Coalition, which ultimately turned into Tucson Lesbian and Gay Pride Committee, which ultimately now is the uh, uh, Tucson Pride or the Lesbian Gay, uh, what's it called? Lesbian Gay coalition i guess it is again uh but anyway uh, when i first and i thought i'd give you a little bit of the history because randy spoke about wingspan um wayne blankenship and patrick grace were members of tucson lesbian gay pride committee uh and they uh decided to start the youth group and they started the youth group and then we decided and Tucson Lesbian Gay Pride Committee was funding that project. 
um, it, which ultimately turned into Wingspan. And the Gay Pride Committee, for me, really opened the door to the gay community. Um, I got there and we were $283 in debt to the Phoenix Pride Committee. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. This is not good. We need to raise some money. So I kind of took over the fundraising and um, we did things like mud wrestling and Sunday softball in the parks and sold hot dogs and beer. Um, we did Cinco de Mayo, which was a big weekend for, uh, and I got a lot of the um, drag queens, the female impersonators, to run as king and queen of Cinco de Mayo. So it became a big competition and they raised tons of money for us. And we went from negative $283 to thousands of dollars to produce the Gay Pride Picnic every year. I did that for 15 years, helped produce the Gay Pride Picnic um, in Himmel Park. And um, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun doing it. Some of the other things that came out of the Tucson Lesbian Gay Pride Committee was Tucson AIDS Project. I was a member of the subcommittee of, um, it was the health subcommittee of the Tucson Lesbian Gay Pride Committee. And I said, oh, that's not good. We can't have, that can't be our name. We can't advertise or, or raise funds as the health subcommittee of the Tucson Lesbian Gay Pride Committee. We need to call it something else. So we named that subcommittee Tucson AIDS Project. And that developed out of the Lesbian Gay Pride Committee. So lots of things. Um, Randy was talking about Wingspan and the backstory of that came from the uh, Lesbian Gay Pride Committee. So I'm very happy to be a part of that still. And I'm not an active participant, but I am a part of it and very proud of that. Okay, thanks, Natalie. We're going to hear a lot more from uh, the three. I'm going to ask uh, Randy to start us off. And the first topic that we're going to, and this would like be like popcorn. The three of them will just be like talking after a dinner party or something. So Randy, the t uh, and then we'll go and just, Natalie, you and Colette jump in. Connecting with people. How did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 90s, how did people connect with people? Bars, events, socially, et cetera? If you just kick, us, kick that discussion off. Sure. Well, um, this is all, of course, pre-internet. Um, you know, that didn't exist and that kind of connecting. So it all was personal and in person. Um, uh, uh, so it, the first gay bar I ever went to um, was the Stonewall, or no, Sir James. Sir James, I think we talked about that. Yeah, it was called Sir James. That was the first one I went to, and that was pretty amazing. Uh, I'd never seen such an amazing collection of, of different kinds of people. And the first time I walked up to the bar, terrified to get a drink, uh, I'm standing between two people who were seated at the bar, and one of them was one of my professors uh, from the university. Um, um, and so that was a little terrifying. Um, but uh, um, definitely it was through bars. Um, um, you know, there were, Stonewall was one, certainly Colette's bar, you know, I, I don't know how many different ones. There were many downtown. Uh, the, the bar at the Congress Hotel was sort of a, secretive gay bar it wasn't you know they didn't advertise but but all the clientele were gay and at, at that time um, uh, um, uh, so bars were definitely the place and later on you know there were some alternative magazines that would do the personal so you could meet people that way i get this is pre grinder um, um, but uh, 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 definitely in person i remember uh, later after ibt's open we would go to the shanty and have a drink at not, you know, because the bars don't get going until 10 o'clock, which I always, well, would certainly regret now. I'm, I'm well in bed by then, but um, uh, 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 having a drink, say, at the shanty and walking up the street 
you know, to, to IBTs, but it was definitely that kind of connection. And, and what happened for me real fast is that I, I met someone that I actually fell in love with um, and it didn't work out for us to be lovers, but we became very best friends. And through him, um, my life changed and I, I met just incredible people that I connected with and it was just, it was fantastic. Here in Natalie or Colette? Yeah, the bar scene, I, I mean, I joined uh, TL, or the Tucson Gay Coalition and we met at, um, what was the name of that bar at Drachman and Stone? Jekyll and Heights. Yeah, no. Fine Line. Uh, fine Line. Oh. That we met upstairs in the Fine Line. So uh, I, I met most of the people that I met in those very young days um, through the bar scene. And much of our fundraising was through the bar scene and um, uh, of course I was actively involved in that. I wanted to, and I forgot to say, I was um, a member of Tucson AIDS Project when we started it and then ultimately uh, went off into the counseling area and we formed uh, the Shanti Foundation. And I was the director of that for a few years also. So uh, what Colette was talking about, us really getting, digging in and taking care of our gay brothers um, during those early years was very important. Colette? <clears throat> you know, before Wingspan, uh, the bars were really the uh, INR. You know, we were the information referral you know, our phone rang all day, you know, not for, you know, what's going on there tonight, but, you know, how are the schools, you know, if we have children, is, is there safety? So we, we were a wealth of information and it was really the place to, to gather, to meet other people um, with similar interests. And, you know, we did so many different things um, at the bar because there was no place else. You know, and now you don't need it really. Um, but you know, it was, it, it was well needed back then to gather. And I decided that I was not going to be in a dark alley, you know, off in some, you know, dingy neighborhood. Um, you know, I got the biggest marquee on Speedway and I thought, you know, they're going to see me, they're going to hear me <laughs> and, you know, they're going to know we're here. And so uh, it was just really important for women to have a, a safe place and everybody. And again, you know, my tag was, women's bar where everyone's welcome. And as you said, my dad was the door person. And uh, so it's just, you know, it was really the only place, place to gather back then. So, you know, it wasn't just <clears throat> cocktails. It was more community, you know, to find out, you know, what was happening, you know, where to go, you know, during the AIDS crisis, how to get health care, and so many different things. So we were, we were a, a building that served alcohol but provided so many other services. Colette, you had at one point in talking with me mentioned about how uh, straight men were like thrilled to find your bar. Oh, well, <laughs> both, both bars I opened. The first one was in 1983 on First Avenue and <clears throat> all my friends um, that I used to run around with, they were all cowboys and they were so mad I took one of the best cowboy bars and turned into a lesbian bar and you know then I went to, we needed a bigger place so I went over to Speedway which was a Smiley's and it was a it had been a, a topless bar dancing bar which the queens end up falling in love with me because we actually had a mirror dressing room you know they didn't have to be in their motorhomes out back so it would be just hysterical you know guys who had been drinking there over the years maybe in from out of town would walk in and see a bar full of women, and man, and that's when there were pay phones. They'd run over the phone, you know, call their buddies, and you know. And I had a <clears throat> a sign on my door, you know, what happens here may offend you, but what goes on in here is very normal. You know, we're a gay bar, and you know, if you're offended, please leave. Um, you know, so, but I still today have such good friends, straight men that I met that used to come in there, and really. Um, 
you know, we're like, oh, wow, they had no idea what the gay community and the women's community was like. So, um, and I had, um, you know, my first DJ was Ronnie Rios. Those of you who remember him and a lot of, um, I had gay men work there too. I didn't want to be, I was tired of being segregated. And that was my real motivation for owning, opening the bar because we were segregated in the seventies. You know, I wasn't allowed to go to, um, Stonewall or, or back pocket. Uh, and so I really pissed me off. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to open, I'm going to open my own place and I'm going to let everybody in. So that was my motivator discrimination. Mark, Mark Rosenbaum also DJed there. And there was still some stripping that went on in the back, <laughs> in the back <laughs> of the bar <laughs> and out in the parking lot. I can testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Randy, were you going to say something? You're muted. There we go. Um, I was just going to say, thinking back to, and I, I'm, I'm positive many people here today are going to remember this part of it, but just the dancing was just incredible. You know, it was just so fun to go dancing. It was, I'm mean, not just to meet somebody, but, but to go dancing was just a really, really fun thing to do. You know, that I, I don't know if people dance so much anymore, but uh, uh, it sure was great then. Yeah, we would get on the dance floor at the fine line and be on there for two hours straight, never come off the dance floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same at IBTs, <coughs> same at Colette's. And it didn't end there. From there, we went to someone's house. <laughs> I danced in a many of the shower with people I didn't know <laughs> <laughs> until, until four in the morning <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be alive and, and I can remember some of the crazy stories so you know and, and really the bar you know for many of you know you know got me sober you know I'll be 36 years this year and you know it, it was the best thing that ever happened to me I was able to provide a venue for women and I was able to get sober so you know how crazy is that you know, to be sober in a bar. I don't know. You know, I'm just a little bit different. So, Natalie, you mentioned, and then I'd like Colette and uh, Natalie, uh, Randy to jump in, about some of the events that took place during that time. You'd mentioned Pride at Himmel Park, uh, Jello wrestling, or just what were some of the things that you all remember happening? Well, there were those things. Um, I think that something that really brought the community together um, on a weekly basis were our softball games because every every bar and organization the the uh, leather clubs would put a team together the bars would put a team together the organizations would put a team together and it started out as um, the Gay Pride Committee, but then Shanti took over that uh, uh, activity. And every weekend we had softball games going on in the park and people having beer and eating hot dogs and just a real sense of community um, outdoors and and physically you know having physical activity so that was a lot of fun we sponsored things like the twinkle ball um at christmas time cinco de mayo um it, you know in may that weekend in may uh jello wrestling actually started out as mud wrestling um <laughs> mud wrestling was the precursor to jello wrestling um, and then, uh, what else? Oh, the, uh, observer benefits. We did huge, two, 300 people would attend for, um, the Tucson Weekly Observer, which was the newspaper. And we did that every year, uh, the observer benefits. So, and those were a huge uh, community activity that, that went on every year and everybody supported because we loved going out on Wednesdays at, uh, to the bar and picking up the new newspaper every week. 
every single week. I think Bob and Gary put out the newspaper for 31 years every week. It was the long, I think that was the record for any uh, uh, gay rag, yeah, public. Gay, gay rag. Yeah, gay publication in the United States. I think it was the longest in the United States. And it was amazing we never had to pick up the two of them on Wednesday. I mean, how many bars did they hit to drop off papers? And each one, you know, they'd have to have a couple of drinks and how they ever got home in that station wagon. I <laughs> I know. <laughs> that old Volvo station wagon. Yeah. But I, I think because of this, I mean, I, I think, and I'll, I just keep continue to go back that the thing that struck me most about um, finding, you know, figuring out that I was a lesbian and finding this community is that how we take care of one another, you know, and how we, we made sure we found one another, you know, and even now it continues with senior pride. We don't leave people behind. You know, we're constantly trying to connect and keep people connected so that, you know, they're not lonely or they're not forgotten. And I think that to me, what I learned um, in this community and, and the gift that, that I was given is the friendships and, and the hard work that everybody did to make sure that we all had a place that we felt safe and that we could find and really explore and develop, you know, who we were. You know, I, I see Kathleen here and, you know, thinking about, you know, when people, you know, played in my bar and, um, you know, it's just so many connections, you know, so many yep. connections and, you know, they're lifetime connections, so. Randy, anything, any events or stuff that you remember? You're muted, Randy. Some of the events I remember were later um, and they were involving Wingspan, benefits for Wingspan that were just amazing, huge productions that were just incredible, uh, you know, fantastic ones that, that, that people could come together and celebrate and raise money for the community center. Do any of the three of you have any uh, memories or connections with some of the things like the uh, rodeo or the uh, bears or music or dances or anything like that? I think if you owned a bar, all the bears, we had Saturday nights, so where the bears would raise money and the rodeo, which was a huge, huge event in Arizona, you know, not only Phoenix, but, but Arizona. And I'm just gonna go off to a story that just warmed my heart. Two weeks ago, <clears throat> I got an email from a, a, fe a fellow. And I, I said, can I FaceTime you? He said, I met you 23 years ago hmm. at a wingspan dinner. And you took the time to talk to this young man. He said, you were a big sponsor and I was nobody and you talked to me. And he said, I've never forgotten that. Hmm. And my husband and I are moving to Tucson and we're hoping you would help us buy a house. I said, can I get your phone number? I have to, you know, I, and I said, Tomas, I don't remember you. I can't tell you. But thank you for sharing that heartfelt story, you know, and, and again, that's, I think, you know, everything, Bruce, you keep saying, what, what is it? It's the connection that, you know, like you said, Randy, at the wingspan dinners, you know, bringing, I remember when Mayor walk up and his wife, Beth, you know, sat at my table and, and just all the different people that we brought to the community, you know, brought into the community to, you know, meet us and find out that, we were, you know, productive um, citizens and just wanted the same rights as everybody else. Colette, why don't you, you, you since we're on that topic, jump in and uh, again, Natalie and Randy too, the, the sort of environment, the legal environment, the political environment, the support of the council or the fights about that, the deaths that occur, the murder, any thoughts or recollections about that time? So uh, again, I go back to the gay, uh, Tucson Gay Coalition. In 1976, it was founded. In 1977, they uh, 
spearheaded the drive for anti-discrimination. And the first uh, proclamation for anti-discrimination was signed in 1977 by the mayor and city council. And um, that was before I was even involved. There were people already uh, working hard, Jack Stockslager, Chris Jones, uh, several other people who, uh, because of that, there was a law enforcement subcommittee on the